A human being has a shelf life. It's a strange thought, given how essential we tend to think we are, as though we'll be around forever. But we won't. We're born, we ripen, we die. And how do we die? I was on my knees, boxer shorts around an ankle, not only praying, but vomiting, and not only vomiting, but battling ferocious incontinence, when I realized we all die like dogs. The monastery was empty, which suited me. I liked to suffer alone. The other monks were on retreat in LA, but I'd stayed behind to watch camp. An hour earlier, I'd awoken with a sting in my left side, as though I'd swallowed a fish hook and someone was tugging the line. It felt like a communication from the land of the dead. After two more hours of vomiting, then spinning around, sitting and shitting, vomiting and shitting, vomiting and shitting, my hands started tingling and my eyes felt fuzzy, almost carbonated. I saw stars. The only thing that could hurt this much, in just this way, is giving birth, I thought, or dying. I fell to the carpet before the toilet and just began to wail. I rested my head on my clenched fists and screamed, please, God, please, God, please, God, but you cannot free your way around what God has placed squarely in your path. So I called 911. I was huddled in a death clump in the room where my teacher gives private interviews when the paramedics stormed the cabin. I think I have food poisoning, I said. The tall, sinewy one from the fire department produced a silver tube with activated charcoal. He had a sweet expression and trustworthy eyes. Will that make me throw up? I asked. No. Are you just saying that? No, sir, we don't do that. I sucked down some of the thick paste and instantly scream puked all over the wall on carpet and a row of my teacher's robes, which were hanging on a hook in plastic dry cleaning bags. We're going to take you to the hospital, he said. Moments later, I was staring at the ambulance ceiling. A big, strong woman put a blanket over me, tastefully covering my dick, which was hanging out of my boxers, sloping to one side like an exhausted gerbil. She kept asking, you okay? When I was not, she would hold open a plastic bag, I would tilt my head, and more horrible wonders would fall out of my mouth. In this way, we inched down the mountain switchbacks. I was being escorted not only to a hospital, but to a whole new frame of mind. I was about to become a patient, which is a telling term. Patience is key to your mental health when you're physically ill. It is one of the few virtues you can actively cultivate when your body ceases to cooperate. When sick, you must practice the lost art of waiting and seeing, for your life is now on the hold. You must slow down to meet the rhythms of a body that is fighting with itself for you. The problem is, once you do slow down, the demons, the anxieties and fears you were fleeting, the anxieties and fears you were fleeing while you were healthy, finally catch up. Now, when you're at your lowest, they swarm over you and feast on you. Like those African ants that devour wildebeest from hook to horn, a black stream rushing over heaving flesh, washing away the meat, organs, entrails, leaving nothing but gleaming white bone. All the surfaces in the ER were lined with hard tiles so that blood and guts could be easily hosed down the floor drains. Nurses wheeled my gurney behind a plastic curtain. I wasn't sure who I belonged to. Several medical professionals poked me and took my information, but everyone seemed to have someplace else to be. They kept asking for my social security number, which served to remind me that I was incurring expenses that would be somewhere in between the price of a nice used car and a commercial flight to outer space. I began making up numbers. Six, 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 nine, six, nine, six, nine. That's an odd number. I vomited into a plastic bag. 